You know what? I know what clip you all think I'm going to use for the intro. I'm sorry to ruin the party, but it's not happening. It's low-hanging fruit, and I'd never stoop so low as to... <laughs> uh, whoops. Sergio Kun Aguero. Who is this man? Well, for anyone unaware, he's a pro streamer that dabbled in football from time to time. And if we're being honest, he's pretty damn good at both professions. No! In all seriousness, Aguero is one of the greatest strikers of this generation, the fourth highest goalscorer in Premier League history, and a very strong contender for the greatest Manchester City player of all time. And depending on who you ask, it's not even a contest. Unfortunately, a few short weeks ago, his career had to be cut short due to heart complications, a headline which left many fearing the worst. But fortunately, he is still well and the end result was only retirement. This was of course unfortunate for those of us who loved watching him play, but there is more to life than the pitch. So realistically, this was good news. You really should always prioritize your health, guys. In any case, Kun Aguero is one of the most celebrated players on earth. Very few people, if any, dislike the man. And because of this, we're going to take a look back at what made him so special. So, with that being said, how good was Sergio Aguero? Yo, what is happening everyone? Really hope you all had a good festive season and are fresh for the new year. It'll be a good one, I can feel it. If you be so kind, feel free to give this video a thumbs up, it's free, and if you do it, I'll give you a high five. I promise. Let's begin. The year is 1988, the location is Buenos Aires, and Sergio Aguero has just been brought into this world. His birth in itself was labelled as something of a miracle, as his mother, who was only 17 at the time, had her water broken only six and a half months into her pregnancy, a complication which was only solved after his parents made a three-hour journey to a hospital which was capable of assisting them with prolonging her due date. Two months later, and when his mother had eventually gone into labour, young Sergio was stuck and more intervention was needed to assist with his birthing, a procedure which resulted in his collarbone being fractured. Upon his eventual birth, the circumstances that led to it left the doctor believing that this baby would surely bring luck to his family. Oh boy, he wasn't wrong. As the years ticked by, Aguero inevitably grew in footballing ability. It all came naturally to him an understanding and passion for the game that is only present in a kid that lives and breathes the game. It was also early on that he received his current nickname, Kun. His favorite anime as a kid was a show called Kum Kum. After going on and on about the show, his grandfather began calling him Kun, and I guess the name stuck. The main takeaway here is that this is more proof that anime is indeed universal, guys. That, or maybe I'm just too hyped to see how Attack on Titan finally ends. Also, if you're thinking about spoiling it for people in the comments, just, you know, just, just don't. Just, just be better. Just be a better human being. That's, that's all I ask. Anyway, back to Aguero. Fast forward a couple years and, at the age of 9, an extremely impressive Sergio Aguero was now developing his trade in the Independiente Youth Academy. As the years progressed, he only went up and up and up, until to the surprise of nobody that actually watched him at the time, he became the youngest player to ever feature in Argentina's Premier Division. The year was 2003 and he was only 15 years and 25 days old. The kid was very clearly going places. Fast forward to 2005 at just 17, and Aguero was now one of the most coveted young prospects in the world, let alone South America. A guaranteed starter at Independiente, scoring 18 goals and 36 appearances overall. We'll go into his attributes in a bit, but for now, all you need to know was that the guy was electric back then. Fast, agile, and extremely energetic. Which is just another way of saying that just about everyone knew that he wouldn't be staying in Argentina for much longer. So when Atletico Madrid came knocking with a 20 million euro offer in May of 2006, only one outcome was expected. The, the, the outcome was a transfer to, to Atletico, in case anyone was wondering. Sergio Aguero at his peak turned out to be one of the greatest strikers in the world, a combination of natural ability, hard work and obviously strong mentorship. And on the mentorship side, he probably couldn't have picked a better club to transfer to than Atletico Madrid. If you're unaware, this club seems to have some sort of stronghold on top attacking talent in the world, more specifically central attacking talent. Fernando Torres, Sergio Aguero, Diego Forlan, Radamal Falcao, Diego Costa, Antoine Griezmann, João Felix. The list goes on. 
Is this even fair? Anyway, at the time when Aguero rocked up, ahead of him stood El Nino Fernando Torres. His first year at Vicente Calderon was spent mostly learning the ropes and getting into the swing of things. However, with Torres as his striking partner, getting him acclimatized to the league was probably not as daunting as it could have been. And if you want further proof of the bond they shared, here's a fun fact. Both him and Torres are avid Lord of the Rings fans and both have their own names tattooed on their wrists in Tengwa, an elvish language in the series. <laughs> Look at these nerds. Six goals and 38 appearances in his first season is pretty good for an 18 year old, but it isn't mind boggling. 19 goals and 37 the next? Now that is headline worthy. At 19 years old, Sergio Aguero was arguably Atletico's most important player. He was their golden boy, which is evidenced even more as he won the 2007 Golden Boy Award. Basically the Ballon d'Or for those under 21. Torres left for Liverpool, but just as quickly as he left, Diego Forlan came in to replace him. When it came to mentors, this man was spoiled for choice. Over the next couple of years, the man did nothing but improve. Atletico didn't do much in the league, but to be fair, everyone not named Real Madrid or Barcelona didn't do much either. However, he did succeed on the European stage, winning the 2010 Europa League in a hotly contested final against... F Fulham? The team that finished 12th in the Premier League with a minus 7 goal difference were only a whisker away from being European champions, huh? Don't let your dreams be dreams, kids. In any case, despite the success that would soon come his way, that, as well as the UEFA Super Cup a few months later, would turn out to be the very last continental silverware Aguero would acquire. But we'll get into that in a bit. By this point, going into the 2010-11 season, Aguero was widely regarded as one of the best forwards in the world. 27 goals and 41 appearances in all competitions, and 20 in the league in 32, told you just that. Naturally, he was loved by the fans, and he committed himself to the club, signing a long-term contract running until 2014. That is until only five months later, he got a call from Nick Fury, asking him to join the Avenger. Wait, wait, sorry, wrong team up. I mean, a call from Sheikh Mansour, asking him to join Manchester City's star-studded lineup. They had already assembled the likes of David Silva, Yaya Toure, Eren Dzeko, Carlos Tevez, and so on and so forth. These guys were serious. 35 million pounds later and all it took were 9 minutes in his league debut for him to become a fan favourite at the Etihad. Substituted on against Swansea just before the hour mark, he went on to score 9 minutes after coming on, make an assist and finally score a banger to wrap up a 4-0 win. City fans didn't know it back then but this was only the beginning of an intense love affair. A love affair created in probably the most dramatic Premier League season of all time where Manchester City won their very first Premier League title on goal difference. Second place Manchester United were left in the mud as Aguero scored maybe the most iconic goal in Premier League history. A late winner against QPR that sealed the deal for the citizens and made them champions. And I know I've said this in previous videos but what an assist from Mario Balotelli. Just, just sublime stuff from the Italian. He really made it all happen, you know. In my career so far, it's the most important goal. You score the goal in the last minute to win the title. You're not sure if that's ever going to happen in your career again. I wish I could tell you how I did it, but I can't. I just thought, hit the target. Hit the target as hard as you can and hit the target. And it went in. The man himself. 23 goals in the league and 34 appearances in his first campaign was a good start to more of the same in the years to come. Fast, strong, Agile, skillful, two-footed, great positioning, the works. At 5'8", he wasn't the tallest, but his superb positioning meant he still popped in with a few headed goals from time to time. There are several words we can use to describe this man and his abilities, but one that I think encompasses what he was all about is sharp. He just had that ability to latch onto a ball quickly and know exactly what to do when faced with a goalkeeper or a defender. Unsurprisingly, a second league title followed in 2014, but surprisingly, it took him four full seasons to nab the Golden Boot Award in the league, 26 in 33. Even further to that, this was his only Golden Boot. For a guy that achieved what he has, you would think that he had more, but that's not the case. In any case, fast forward to the onset of the 2016-17 season and Manchester City changed management to make room for serial winner Pep Guardiola. Despite being a positive acquisition for City, this was a cause for concern for Aguero. 
You see, Aguero, like many long-term elite strikers and world-class teams, went through several phases in his tactical deployment for the team. Under Mancini, he played mostly as a second striker to one of either Mario Balotelli or Eden Dzeko. Under Pellegrini, he played as the lone striker but operated mostly as a pure finisher, a guy that more or less only operated in the opposing box. One, two, rarely three touches, and then boom. These roles served him well in his first five seasons at the Etihad, but he was in for a whole new challenge under Guardiola. And it only took about three games with Guardiola in charge for that to become public knowledge. Despite Aguero starting the season strong with three goals in his first two appearances, Guardiola had some choice words for him. It is not enough to receive the ball from his teammates. He has to help us in the first pressure and run a lot and help us a lot with movement. You cannot be brilliant when you disappear when you don't have the ball. Football is a connection between what you have with the ball and without the ball. And almost as quickly as the criticism came to light, his game switched up and everyone had already forgotten Guardiola's words by the time that season had ended. He began to press more, increasing his distance covered per 90 minutes from 8.9 kilometers in the previous season to 10 kilometers per 90 in Guardiola's first year. He began to sprint more, increasing his average number of sprints per 90 from 44 to 60.8 in the same time frame. And despite the added output in other areas, his goal scoring only dropped from 24 in the previous season to 20 in the 16-17 one. The man was not only ruthless and versatile, but he was also relentless. Remember, this is a guy that, by that time, had only scored less than 17 league goals in a season once in his five seasons at the club. The man was already a phenom, yet here he was, still willing to adapt and improve. We can probably all think of top players that wouldn't alter their game for the team in that manner. It tells you a lot about Kun Aguero. He stayed at City for several more seasons and under Guardiola he was part of title winning team after title winning team, a nailed on starter when fit. Speaking of which, Aguero was a sublime goal scorer. I'm sure we all know that by now. It's not like I've gone on about it for the vast majority of this video already, but if I'm being honest, I don't think that neither you nor me are doing him justice by not diving just a little bit deeper on what this man actually achieved in front of goal in the Prem. To illustrate this, I want you all to look at this. What we have on screen at the moment is Sergio Aguero's goal tallies per season. For 8 out of 10 seasons he played in Manchester, he maintained a goal to game ratio of at least 0.64 per season. And when you look into his injury record, particularly in seasons where he played less than 30 games, you begin to realize that he really could have scored many, many more if he were just a bit luckier. If you don't believe me, here's the goal to game ratio for each player in Premier League history that has scored 100 or more goals. And here's Aguero. Here we see Thierry Henry, Harry Kane and Mohamed Salah, but this video isn't about them. The point I'm trying to make is that for someone that was injured as frequently as he was, Aguero really was something else. Okay, so let's bring the focus to 2021. This year was one filled with some very real ups and downs for Aguero, and it didn't start off too well either. At the beginning, he was just coming off a period on the sidelines due to various niggling injuries, and then, boom, COVID. Soon after, it came out that after 10 years of service, Aguero would be leaving Manchester City at the end of the season. A sad sight, but a happy close to a successful tenure, right? Perhaps not. It seemed as though he was being forced out the club as reports were claiming that the decision to not renew his contract came straight from Pep Guardiola, and Aguero was very keen on staying on. The two apparently didn't speak for several weeks following the decision not to renew, but despite this, at the end of the season, the two seemed to be on good terms and Pep Guardiola even teared up when talking about Aguero's contribution to the club as well as his character. Given the circumstances of his departure, I'm not entirely sure how genuine those tears are from Pep. But Aguero is one of the greatest players in Premier League history and certainly contributed tremendously to helping Pep start his tirade on English football. So I'm prepared to give him the benefit of the doubt. I know Pep was waiting for some random guy on the internet to say that, so there you go, my man. Elsewhere, he was already Manchester City's top scorer of all time and the fourth highest goal scorer in Premier League history, breaking a record previously held by Wayne Rooney at Manchester United. His final goal tally when he eventually wrapped up in the Prem was 184 goals. However, he was unfortunately part of the City squad that lost the first ever Champions League final in the club's history to Chelsea. But if we're being real, 
I think the man jinxed himself on the Champions League front years before that anyway. This, this is a cursed headline. On the flip side, he was part of the Argentina side that won the first piece of major silverware for the country in almost three decades. After the disappointment that the country has been through over the years, seeing them lift the 2021 Copa America was nice to see. And then we have Barcelona. Aguero thought he was teaming up with his good friend Leo Messi for Blagrana, only for Messi to fly off to Paris and for Barca to become more and more of a dumpster fire. Although Aguero can probably rest easy knowing that this wasn't really his fault. I mean, it couldn't have been. He was injured for all but four of Barcelona's first 17 games in the 21-22 La Liga season. And his Catalan tenure would unfortunately end after he experienced shortness of breath in a match against Alaves on the 30th of October, a precursor of a condition that would eventually lead to his retirement only three months later, cardiac arrhythmia, an irregularity in the frequency of one's heartbeat. And just like that, he was done. So what can we say about Kun Aguero? He may have had his career cut short, but that will never change the impact he had on football. A Manchester City legend, no doubt. The scorer of the most important goal in the club's history and a very loyal servant all round. But because that is not enough, a statue of the man will be erected outside the Etihad sometime in 2022. Now, he wasn't perfect. In fact, a big criticism of his is that he never brought his club form to the national team and was prone to going missing while with La Albi Celeste. This is mostly true. But the history books probably won't remember that aspect of his game too fondly. And in my opinion, considering everything else he's done in the game, they probably shouldn't. But he wasn't just a great player. The guy seems to genuinely be a good dude. In 2015, for example, after witnessing an Everton fan in the stands in need of medical attention, he successfully signaled to the referee to stop the game to allow the man to be attended to. When leaving City, he gave his car away to the club's kit man and also gifted each staff member of the first team building with a custom tag Hoyer or Hubler watch. He once called Messi midstream just to chat and put it on speaker for the world to hear. A mountain of a man, a mountain of a legacy, Sergio Kun Aguero will not be forgotten. And perhaps the Aguero story isn't done just yet. His son Benjamin not only has Sergio Aguero as a father, but his grandfather on his mother's side, the late great Diego Maradona. And his godfather, the goat himself, Leo Messi. No pressure, kid. And there we have it. Let me know what you all think of Aguero in the comments below. Hope you enjoyed, and I'll catch you in the next one.